We have been everywhere. From the highest peaks to the deepest fathoms. We have seen everything from the smallest elements to the farthest corners of space. We have built empires, defied gravity, conquered the elements. We have cured diseases, made a heart beat again, made the impossible possible again. Who are we? We are humanity, and there is no limit to what we can accomplish together. Okay, there, oh, there we go. Hey, good morning. I want to say hello to everybody that's watching us live on YouTube. Um, those of you that are watching the Ravens game instead of sitting in church, um, go Jaguars? No, not really. Just kidding. Just kidding. Go Broncos, if we're going to be honest. And they whooped on the Cowboys. Y'all know who you are, Mac. I'm talking to you, bro. Um, hey, I am excited that I'm here this morning. I'm excited to be bringing this morning's message. My name is Zach Gibson. I'm the pastor of community here at Arundel Christian Church, and we're excited that you're here with us. We're in the middle of a series called Who Needs God? And I don't know about you, but I've really enjoyed this message, this series of messages. And I'm not just saying that because Matt is my boss, and I'm supposed to enjoy the messages that he preaches. But seriously, though, this has been a fantastic message, and if there's ever been a series here at Arundel Christian Church that you ought to catch up on, this is it. Because we're looking at who needs God, and if you've been here for the last couple of weeks, I think we've established that that's all of us, right? Is we all need God. And so two weeks ago, we talked about those, those gods, that the nun gods, you know, the gods that consistently, time and time again, let us down. You know, the, the bodyguard God that lets things happen in our lives and we don't understand what God is truly doing. Or, or those different gods, those, those pedestal gods. In fact, this series is a series that was written by a pastor named Andy Stanley. He preaches at a church called North Point Church in, outside of Atlanta. And he caught a lot of flack for last week's message, that, that message about the Jesus of the Bible. And uh, people thought, and, and, and they took pieces of his message and basically thought that Andy didn't believe in the Bible anymore, which is crazy. Because if you listen to last week's message, if you listen to what Matt preached about last week, if you listen to what Andy had preached when he preached that message as well, it's in fact the opposite, right? Is we believe that the Bible is true because we believe that Jesus is who he says he is. You know, Jesus made claims in Scripture that he was the one that the Jews were looking for. Let me give you a little homework this week. Read Isaiah chapter 53. So if you have your notes, go ahead and take those out. Take out your bulletin. Write down Isaiah 53. And let me challenge you to read Isaiah 53 this week. Because if you read it, you're going to see that it's talking about somebody that seems pretty stinking familiar. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus said that he was the one that the Jews were looking for. See, here's what happened. Is, is last week's message. If you listen to it out of context, okay, if you listen to it out of context... You would have thought that Matt didn't believe that the Bible was true. You would have thought that maybe the, that Matt didn't believe that Jesus was who he says he was. Okay, but if you read, if you look at that message, if you listen to it, and you take good notes, you'll see that we believe that the Bible is true. Okay, we strive to preach messages that are relevant to all people. But this series in particular, this series is for those of you that are questioning your faith. That you may have grown up in church, you may have gone to church for your whole life, but you've been let down by those nun gods that we talked about two weeks ago. This series is for people that can't reconcile what they've learned about God with what they learned in science or what they've been let down by in their life experiences. You see, some, unfortunately, some people's life experiences are incompatible with the view of God that a lot of churches preach. The injustice, the suffering that we see in our world does not track with the God of love that we see in Scripture. See, the problem is, is that those little G gods that we create, they're never compatible with the living God of the universe. Now, some of you may or may not know this about me, but when I was in seminary, I worked at a really high class establishment. I waited tables and I was a bartender at Applebee's. <laughs> okay, I worked there for over, over two years and it, it, was a, it was a job that got me through seminary. And I, I got to be honest, most nights 
I hated going to work because I had a, I had a degree in biblical studies, and yet I was going to wait tables and, and to clean up after people because, let's be honest, people are disgusting, and they make huge messes, and they get food everywhere, and it's crazy. But I wish I had had the sort of foresight that I have now. You know, they say hindsight is twenty twenty, and I look back on the conversations that I was able to have with people, and, and, and it was in East Tennessee. And if you know anything about East Tennessee, going to church is still the norm. Like, you're the weird family if your family doesn't have a church that you belong to. There's churches literally on every single corner in East Tennessee. And so for a lot of the people that I worked with, they'd been... They'd been kicked out of church. They'd been burned by church. And so there was a lot of conversations I had with people that were hurt because of the faith of their childhood had let them down. A lot of people walked away from faith because of the kind of gods that Matt talked about two weeks ago. Because the the Bible tells me so wasn't a good enough reason for them as they looked at their lives. You know, the on-demand God was done taking requests. See, If you find the nun gods to be irreconcilable, good. We do too. See, the point of this series is very simple. Who needs God? We all do. See, the faith that we had as children is not good enough anymore. The faith that we may have gotten from our parents, the faith that we may have learned in Sunday school a trillion years ago is not good enough anymore. Let's think about it. As an adult, what are some of those things that you would be ridiculous if you still did as an adult that you did as a child? I brought some pictures. The first of which is you can't just sleep wherever you want as an adult. Now, this first picture really reminds me of me and Zach um, is, is sleeping wherever we want. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go home this afternoon, and I guarantee you when I'm watching football, I'm going to be out on the couch. Okay, here's another one. You can't cruise around completely naked anymore as an adult. Like, that's frowned upon. And some of you are thinking about it. Don't do it. It's a bad idea. Here's another one that's coming up. You can't go trick-or-treating as an adult. You should probably take your children trick-or-treating, but as an adult, you shouldn't do it. It's frowned upon. Okay, now a few years ago, we had a lady ring our doorbell, and she was the only trick-or-treater that we got. And she was older than us. And I was so taken aback, I put candy in her bucket, and then I, I told Chrissy, I'm like, we just had a lady in her 40s that just trick-or-treated. She's like, did you give her candy? And I was like, I was, yeah, I, I didn't know what to do, so I gave her candy. You know, that's what you do. Here's another one. Imagine if you're out to lunch with people that you work with. You can't just spit out something you don't like. <laughs> like, that's a bad idea. Now, there are adults that do that. Like, and sometimes if you eat something that's too hot, sometimes you have to so you don't burn your tongue. But seriously, you can't just let it let it come out, right? Here's the last one. You shouldn't laugh at people's bodily functions. When somebody cuts one, when somebody burps, you shouldn't laugh at those things. Like, it's it's not okay. (laughs) Although sometimes I still do. It's okay. In fact, a couple weeks ago, I may have given Mackenzie a high five. (laughs) Full disclosure here, people. You know, how about the things that we were afraid of as kids that are sometimes irrational as adults? Spiders? Okay, now that one's still completely legitimate, okay? Spiders are ridiculous. Here's one that's come up a little bit recently. Clowns. Still completely legitimate. Those guys are shady, right? You know, for me, it was the fear of the dark when I was a kid. I'm not afraid of the dark anymore. In fact, like, I want my room as dark as possible, right? You know, but my parents would watch Unsolved Mysteries, and I was always afraid that somebody that was in one of those Unsolved Mysteries was going to come and murder me in my sleep. Like, I didn't sleep for all of third grade. Okay, I remember being a zombie in third grade because of unsolved mysteries. You know, but you know, storms, height, you know, fear of heights. Okay, there's still a lot of people that are afraid of those things. But if we look at our lives, okay, if we look at the way that we acted as children, okay, it would be ridiculous for us to continue doing those things. But for a lot of us, we hold on to that faith of our childhood, one that was shaped by, by simple stories, okay, one that was shaped by a simple understanding of a complex God. See, as we grow up, we need to grow up in our faith as well. We can't follow that Bible tells me so, God, because Christianity doesn't exist because of the Bible. If you were here last week, man, that was so powerful. 
as we look at the story of Christianity, Christianity, an illegal religion, became the state religion of Rome before the Bible was ever canonized. The Bible was canonized in the middle of the 4th century, but by 312, Christianity had become the religion of the most powerful empire on earth. And it wasn't because of the Bible. It was because of an event. It was because Jesus was who he said he was. And he said he was going to raise from the dead. He was going to rise from the dead on the third day. And he did it. And so Christianity became the state religion of this most powerful empire. Not because of the Bible. So before the Bible ever existed, the story of a simple Jewish carpenter from a nothing town in Palestine changed the course of of the entire world. He replaced the pantheon of the Roman gods. Christianity became what it was because people saw a risen Jesus. They saw him die on a Friday, and on Sunday, they saw him alive again, and it changed the course of history. So let's update that song. Jesus loves me, this I know, because people like John watched Jesus die And then had breakfast with him a few days later on a beach. Because people like Luke interviewed eyewitnesses. And they were found to be believable. If you don't believe me, read Luke chapter 1 and Acts chapter 1. Because a Pharisee named Saul encountered the living Jesus on the road to Damascus. And his life was never the same. Christianity didn't interrupt an empire because of a book. No, we have that book because of. Christianity interrupted an empire. You see, people follow Jesus after the resurrection because of the resurrection. Now, if you're here this morning reconsidering God, then let's start with Jesus. So if Jesus is trustworthy, if Jesus is who he said he is, okay, if he is who he said he was in the New Testament, then what he says about God is also therefore trustworthy. So we can believe what Jesus said about God because Jesus was who he said he was, and he did what he said he was going to do. So we're going to look at the New Testament and see what Jesus said about God. Specifically, we're going to look at the book of John. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open up to John chapter 14. Okay, John chapter 14. We're going to spend quite a bit of time in the book of John this morning. See, John was the disciple that Jesus loved. Now, that's the way he described himself. He was speaking about himself in the third person, which is Completely different topic for another time. We're just going to go with it. Okay, so John was with Jesus until the end. John watched Jesus die. And you know what? John lost his faith for three days. But John knew that Jesus was who he said he was when he saw him alive again on Sunday. See, John, who would eventually be exiled to rot on the island of Patmos because Domitian knew that he, if he killed John, even more people would come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. You know, what the Romans were seeing is that as they killed these apostles, these disciples, these close followers of Jesus, more and more people were following Jesus. See, John, who had seen more bloodshed, who had seen more people he loved killed for the cause of Christ, After he had seen the temple burnt to the ground by Titus, John, who walked with Jesus day after day for three and a half years, they shared life together. He wrote these words in John 14, verse 7. Here's what it says. If you really know me, you will know my father as well. Let that sink in for just a second. If you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, he goes on, from now on, you do know him. And have seen him. Now Philip responds in a way that most of us would have been thinking. But most of us would have been smart enough not to say anything. It's one of those moments where you know you should keep your thoughts to yourself. And poor Philip, man. We see him recorded in history. For the rest of history as being the one without a filter, right? So here's what he says in verse 8. He says, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough. Show us the Father and that will be enough. Poor Philip. I'm thinking the other disciples were probably glad it wasn't them. Have you ever been in a room where somebody says something ridiculous? And you're like, man, thank God I didn't say it because I was thinking the same thing. So I'm thinking that's what the disciples were thinking. Here we go. Let's pick it up in verse 9. Here's Jesus' response. Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you for such a long time, 
Now, John 14 is being written within that last week of Jesus' ministry. If you read the book of John, it's interesting. It is half of the book of John happens within that last week of Jesus' life. And so Jesus says, dude, you've been with me for three and a half years. Like, how do you still not get it? He picks it up. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it's the Father living in me who is doing his work. So if you want to know the Father, if you want to know the Father, the, the best thing for you to do is to look at Jesus. Jesus is as close as we're ever going to get this side of heaven to knowing who the Father is. So if you want to know what God is like, look at what Jesus said about God. Jesus is saying, if you want to know what God is up to, watch me. Now, before we can see who the God of Jesus truly is, we have to be sure that we've thrown out our childlike view of God. We have to get rid of those non-gods. We have to get rid of those ideas, and we have to start with a fresh perspective and base it only on who Jesus said that God is. So here's number one, if you'll write this down. Jesus said that God is spirit. Jesus said that God is spirit. Now, that concept of spirit is is a pretty deep concept. It's a pretty heady concept. In John chapter 4, we see Jesus at a well in Samaria, which is an extraordinary feat in and of itself. The Jews would not have, for any reason, walked through Samaria. They avoided it at all costs. You know, I, I, I used to, when I was a youth pastor, I would, would talk about Samaria like driving from California, which is where we lived, to Washington, okay? And, and the fastest way is to go up I-5, okay, Interstate 5, which is like 95, but it's on the West Coast, to so drive up I-5, drive through the state of Oregon, and get to Washington. But if, if you didn't want to drive through Oregon, you know, because Oregon is like full of disease, or, you know, you decide, Okay, you would drive around up through Nevada and through Idaho and then into Washington. You would go over a thousand miles out of your way just to not drive through Oregon. Okay, now Oregon is, is, a, is a wonderful place. It's full of hippies and weird people with beards. Okay, it's a great place. You should go there sometime. But so as we talk about this, the Jews would have walked a day out of their way to avoid Samaria. Now, I don't know about you. Okay, my watch counts my steps. But man, there are a lot of days where I take as few steps as possible. Like if I can walk straight somewhere, I'm going to walk straight somewhere. I'm not going to take the long way. And that's what the Jews would have done to get, to, Samaria, to get around Samaria. And so Jesus is in Samaria at a well. Okay, first of all, wouldn't have been there. Second, he's talking to a Samaritan woman. I don't know if you understand what a big deal this was. Like, you didn't speak to women that you weren't married to, let alone a Samaritan woman. And we see this interaction with Jesus at the well, and here's what Jesus says about God. He says, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and truth. Here's the reality of what spirit means, is that God is immaterial. God is spaceless. God is timeless. He's not bound by our finite understanding. Now this explains why God in the Old Testament was so against idols. Why he was so against graven images. Because how can you take a God that is not bound by anything that we understand and fashion something in his likeness? It would be like one of those doodles that your kids do. And you know what I'm talking about where they take a piece of paper and they just go to town with a marker and it's just a bunch of lines and squiggles and then they show it to you and they say, look, Daddy, I drew our house. And one part of you are like, that's super adorable. And then the other part of you is like, that looks nothing like our house. But that's what we do to God and, and, and that's what was going on in this time frame. When God says you shouldn't have any idols, God was like, look, this doesn't look anything like me and not even close, not even close. See, this is what flew in the face of other religions within the first century and earlier, is all of those religions, they had images of what they believed that God looked like, what their gods looked like. The Romans had all of their gods, and the Greeks had their gods, and the Babylonians, and the the Egyptians. They all had images of their gods. And then the Israelites were like, look, our God said don't make any images, and so we don't have any. And do you know what got them in trouble a lot? It's when they made images of gods. Okay, it got them in a lot of trouble. 
But see, God is beyond space. He's beyond time. He's beyond anything that we can imagine. So when I say God is spirit, like that's a, a huge concept for us to grasp. He's beyond anything that we can understand. See, if Jesus stopped there, we would all be lost. But here's where Jesus didn't. In fact, this is key. Write this down. Jesus came to make God personal. Jesus came to make God personal. Spirit is not personal. But Jesus came to make God personal. See, here's this idea. We have to understand that God is beyond anything that we can imagine. But then Jesus makes it simpler for us to imagine. So this is number two. God is Father. God is Father. Jesus took this concept that was beyond anything that we could grasp by ourselves, and he makes it something that we can't understand. Seeing God as Father is a way that makes him personal. But there's a flaw in it for a lot of us. For a lot of you guys sitting in this room, if you think of Father, you think of your Father. And for a lot of you, your Father is not somebody that you want to think about as being God. Maybe your dad was absent. Maybe your dad never expressed his love for you. Maybe your dad was, was there, but he was distant. Louis Giglio put it this way. When we talk about God as Father, the best way to look at him is as this. Not the reflection of our earthly Father, the perfection of Father. So not what we think of when we think of Father. And we can look in society and see lots of men that are terrible fathers. The picture of God as Father is as a perfect Father. So it's a concept that we can grasp because we understand fathers. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus is praying and his disciples, they, they understand that they're, they're struggling with their own prayer lives. And they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, teach us how to pray. This is what Jesus says in, in Luke 11 verse 2. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father. And I think we all know the rest of that where it goes. It's the Lord's Prayer. It's recorded in Luke 11. It's also re recorded in Matthew. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. But it's that, that idea of starting with a picture of Father. By saying that God is Father, he's implying that the God of the universe, the God who created everything, is personal. God is near. He's not some distant deity that we need to appease so he doesn't smite us. He's Father, which is a concept that we can understand. You know, there are people in this world whose brains are far beyond anything that I could imagine. People who create these unbelievable things. But the concept of an eternal and timeless God, an all-powerful, unmoved mover, is beyond their comprehension. So Jesus breaks it down and puts God in a way that we can understand. Father is something that's tangible. It's a known quantity. See, God is spirit. He's beyond our comprehension but he's also personal. He's Father. See, decades after Jesus had ascended into heaven, John wrote these words in 1 John chapter 4. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. God is love. So this is number three in your notes. God is love. So God is spirit, God is Father, and God is love. See, during his lifetime, John's view of God had been turned on its side. John began as a Jew, as a devout Jew, and he would have believed as a devout Jew that, that God loved the Jews, and he tolerated everybody else. If you look at, at, at the Jewish scripture, at the Old Testament, we see that the Jews were God's people, and that everybody else was kind of incidental. See, first century Jews believed so much that God only tolerated other people that they wouldn't darken the door of the house of a Gentile, let alone invite them into their house. They would be ceremonially unclean for a long time if they did that. And so John began this life as a Jew. He began his life with that Jewish picture of who God is. He's also the same John that we've spent a lot of time talking about the fact that his encounter with Jesus, his three and a half years with Jesus, the time he spent with Jesus, turned his life upside down. John witnessed unbelievable miracles. He was there for the crucifixion. He saw the resurrected Jesus. He witnessed the ascension of Jesus into heaven. He was there on the day of Pentecost where God poured out his Holy Spirit on the people and they, they spoke in tongues. He saw miracles. He saw miraculous things. 
He endured the persecution and martyrdom of people that he loved. And he writes these simple words, that God is love. Love encapsulates God's interaction with humanity from the very beginning. The entirety of the story of God is a story where God is pursuing humanity. You know, there's a verse that most of us know by heart, and John wrote it. It's John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. There's some words in there that I've talked about before, but I want you to understand is John wrote these words after God had turned his view of humanity on its side. Is that God is love. And he doesn't just love the Jews. He doesn't just love a single people group. But he loves every single person in the world. So much so that he laid his life down for us. See, the last part of what, Jesus, or what John says in 1 John 4, 16. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. See, that love is what Jesus said would set his disciples apart. We see as Jesus gathers his disciples together and he gives them his last instructions in John. He tells them, look, this is what you're going to do. This is how you're going to do it. It's not about how much money you give. It's not about how many times in a row you're at church. It's not about how many Bible verses you know. Okay, This is how you'll know. John 13, 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So if God is love, then we reflect that love by the way that we treat other people, by the way that we interact with other people. Let's talk about it in terms that I hope you all understand. Shade. Let's talk about shade for a second. Shade requires something very important. Sunlight. You can't have shade without sunlight. You can have sunlight without shade, but you can't have shade without sunlight. See, just as shade requires sunlight, evil requires good. Goodness has to pre-exist evil. Now, this is so important. Because God is pre-existent, he cannot be evil. Because goodness pre-exists evil. This is how we know that other gods are not real. Okay, these gods that were petty, these little G gods that were were tormenting humanity couldn't be God. Because the essence of God is love. You see, we recognize injustice and evil in this world because good pre-exists it. Because we know what good is, we know what evil is. So when we appeal to, to justice, to love, we're declaring the existence of God. We just may not even realize it. See, God's moral law is written on our hearts. It's written on our hearts so that we know what's right and what's wrong. When we seek shade, we declare the existence and the power of the Son. When we seek what's right, whether we realize it or not, we declare the existence of God. So this all begs a question. If God is love, then why is there evil in this world? I'm going to let Matt tackle that next week. I'm going to pass the buck. But it also raises another question. How do you know that there's evil in this world? How do you know what's right and what's wrong? How do you know what you ought to do? Where does that innate sense come from? It's because goodness is preexistent. Perfect love casts out fear. So let's keep this in mind. Let's keep the God of Jesus in mind. God is spirit. And he's closer than any of us could ever imagine. God is personal. He's father. And he shows us that by being love. Love is the essence of who God is. He's not just any father. He's the perfect father. When it comes to God, Jesus is our best and most reliable source. And what Jesus said about God can be trusted. Let's pray. Father God, we are are grateful for the picture of you that we see from Jesus. God, we believe this morning that his words can be trusted. Lord, as we we leave this place, God, we pray that, that you would be in our conversations. God, that you would help us to show the people that we interact with this week that you are real. God, that you are close. 
and that you love all of humanity. God, we're grateful for all that you do for us. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thanks a lot, guys. You guys have a great week.